uh, welcome to uh, the PSA talk. Uh, today we have Yeni Salmon, uh, invited by the department, MTNM, Master in Transdisciplinary New Media, and the Communication Design Department also. Um, uh, is going to talk about his um, thesis, PhD thesis, in not all of it, basically, uh, that is um, PhDs here at the NSAT. Um, so just to tell you a little bit about him, Yanis Azmon is a Paris-based designer, artist, and researcher. His work investigates the tensions between code and matter uh, at the intersection of computation, data-driven design, and digital manufacturing. His main research interest lies in the question of materiality and its relationship between digital design methods, instruments, and ideologies. Uh, focusing on his re recently completed doctoral research, this talk will attempt to provide a critical regarding of digital fabrication technology through theoretical, historical, and practical perspectives. So I'd like you to continue and okay. talk about yourself. Okay, so thanks first to Lucrezia and um, Klaus who invited me on behalf of their departments to do this talk, and thank you for coming. Uh, I'm teaching here, for those of you who have not had class with me, or those of you who are not student here, uh, in so communication design and, and uh, a new media department. And I'm going to do a talk about uh, explaining a bit what my PhD research was about. And as a kind of general introduction to this topic, I want to also, and to make the connection with what I'm teaching here, uh, I want to say a few words about uh, my field in general as a kind of a, a discipline uh, of practice. So, um, my field is called, uh, you could call it computational design uh, or generative design. I don't really make a difference between those terms after uh, giving it a lot of thinking. It seems that uh, also, by the practitioners, the people who use it, they are almost uh, equivalent. In, uh, and I'm going to explain what it means actually to, to talk about computational or, or generative design. So um, the the notion they both they both encode some some characteristics of, of what I'm interested in. So um, you can define generative design or, or computational design as a, an emerging design field or sets of practices that engage with form making, so making of form, not through direct drawing or modeling, but by uh, the building of computational systems and processes. Okay? So instead of uh, drawing directly or modeling um, the, the form of the, or the object you want to design, uh, you are actually building systems that will produce the form. Okay? And by doing so, you engage in an explorative process which allows for the discovery of design solutions. Okay, so this is something that, by nature, uh, has some kind of uh, a dialogue side of it. So you are engaging with, with dialogue with uh, computational systems. And you're doing this not because you want to be more productive than a traditional designer, but really fundamentally because you are interested in from something else. Okay? So we try just as an introduction to, to kind of frame what you, you want to do when you engage in this, this process. Okay? But really to stress, it's not something that's... Uh, whose purpose is to completely us, um, be used as a substitute to traditional design method or, or a replacement. It's really a, a different approach. So a very schematic way of, of um, representing a, um, a traditional design process, very, very schematic, um, you know, it's from mind to hand, right, or mind to mouse or digital tools, so there's a kind of a direct connection between um, the ID, the intention, and a form that, that kind of embodies uh, this, this ID, this intention. And the way you use this, traditionally when you design, you use tools uh, or analog or digital that really allow you to draw, to model, to, to be described in precise terms your intention. Okay? So this is, a, by, by nature, it's a descriptive uh, process. But if, and it has this kind of direct. Even if you work with a computer, it's still, if you, if you look at Photoshop's tool or, or those, those uh, software, they are modeled uh, by analog with, with traditional tools. You have the brush, you've got the pencil, so all, all kind of embody this notion of direct uh, link between hand and, 
in mind. Uh, if you work with computational design or generative design, it's a more mediated process where you have uh, layers of, of kind of um, abstraction agencies between the ID and the form. So you have the algorithm. So basically your ID is usually the idea of a system, of a process, and the algorithm is the you can say it's the logical description, the rational description of the steps, the operation that are involved. Uh, so you translate your idea into, into a set of, of logical operations and then you code it. Okay? So computation obviously means that it's really related to the, the practice of programming. And the difference between the algorithm and the code is that the code is really uh, software, it's operational. The algorithm is the logical description. Okay? Uh, so the code, you can work with several types of, uh, of software, but it's, um, it's also a matter of, of, of preferences. Designers, some work with uh, maybe, you know, processing or this kind of, of stuff. Um, but what matters is really um, the, 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 the conjunction between algorithm and code. Okay? It's the, the whole uh, uh, process. And then finally, you can generate form with this code by running, because it's super rational. It's, um, it can be run on a computer, it can be run on a website, and it can be used to generate a form. And then you engage in two kind of feedback loops. So you modify the parameters of the code, which change the objects, you are, you are the, the forms you are generating, and you also can modify the processes uh, if you actually modify the logics behind the algorithm. Okay? And in those feedback loops, you can see they kind of sit apart from the original ID, which means that uh, it's not like the intuition does not play any role, but it's more that as soon as you engage into this kind of dialogue, you are really kind of negotiating with computational uh, processes. So it's kind of a dialogue with the computer in the sense that you are taking to a place you might not have imagined at first. So it's a very open process uh, by definition, and that's, in my opinion, what makes it really interesting because it allows to discover uh, and to explore some solutions you might not be able to to uh, anticipate at the beginning. So I can show you a few examples of um, my stuff. Uh, so this is uh, a bracelet that I did last year for um, a competition. And it was basically a competition organized by a, a public institute called France Ecla, and they do research and development and uh, also scientific research they are associated with, with a university uh, to evaluate um, all the processes that are involved in luxury, jewelry, uh, also um, uh, watchmaking, all those sectors. And they recently got very interested into metal 3D printing, okay, because it's a, it's, it has a huge impact, potential impact for the sector of jewelry. And so they organized this competition to invite designers to, de to create um, a designs that would exploit the, the possibilities of 3D printing. Okay, so not just again as a way to be more productive, or but really to explore a kind of uh, a new type of formal typologies uh, and so on. So this was one of the finalist projects, and uh, it was inspired by a, a process actually, so not a form uh, from the beginning. So this was this, this process of erosion, the natural process that creates those structures and they are called taphonies. So they are alveolar uh, rock structure that you can find by some, with, with certain environmental uh, conditions by the seaside. So it's apparently the combination of, of um, agrometry and, and the presence of salt that is able to create this. And I was interested in, in knowing this notion of continuity you have, like the surface is kind of receding and you have all those uh, shapes that sometimes are really hollowed and sometimes are half full. And I wanted to kind of recreate this effect in this, in this bracelet because um, also playing with the transparency on the skin. So one side is really completely closed and you can see it progressively opens with all those different uh, cells. Um, I didn't draw it because uh, I could have basically kind of reproduced and modeled, but I really instead designed uh, using this tool that maybe some of you know it. I know some of you know it. It's called Grasshopper. It's basically a programming environment which is visual, so you connect uh, functions and data structures visually. And sometimes I use code like traditional text based, but I really like also to work with these kind of tools for they are very they, they really allow to, they are design tools, okay? So they are not programming tools at the beginning, but design tools so you are very fast and you can iterate. And um, the good part of working with this working with a process instead of drawing one single form is that you can generate variation. 
So you can actually really generate um, a, a lot of different options and then you can evaluate those who make sense for you with different criteria, athletic criteria or can be performance criteria. So in this case, the criteria was purely athletic, but also it, I had to review some kind of constraints uh, that were linked to the fabrication. By the way, I didn't say it, but it was 3D printed in palladium gold. So it's like very high luxury process and they didn't give me the bracelet at the end, obviously. Uh, but, but yeah, so I selected one and, and but potentially, potentially you could, you could make uh, unique pieces and every time with the same process. But, so you would achieve unity, but at the same time variation because you've got the same system, but that gives a lot of different results. Quickly, some other jewelry project I've done. So this one is also using parameters to control this kind of um, harmonic uh, rot rotation, torsion, and this is a rendering, but this was 3D printed in uh, nylon. And again, uh, 3D printed stainless steel with every time kind of simple designs. Also, those were experiments also to try to explore the processes, uh, the printing processes. Um, this actually is kind of cheap to, 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 to print. You can order for from something like 10 euros or something online. Uh, obviously, the gold one is really, <laughs> it's really something else. Oh, I went too far. <coughs> and this is the last one I wanted to show you. It's also, um, this one is a dual surface with, with kind of cushioning uh, effect and also 3D printed in, in, a, in resin. And so you see this, this notion basically of transitioning from drawing to code. Uh, was especially clear in the example of the bracelet it's a transition from unique to viable okay when you're drawing one one uh, object one form you are um, explicit so it's one to one and in this case you have some kind of more one to many uh, uh, relation so this really opens the fundamental part of, of computational design which is the ability to deal with variation variability so uh, if you think about this this kind of process when you have some a piece of code that generates a file, 2D or 3D, and then you get a fabrication process that makes converts this file in, or translate this file into a physical artifact, then there's no really no uh, limit. You can just every time run this code and get a new design. You don't have to use one file. You can just uh, run this code and, and generate variation and this can be this can go all the way to the, the client. If we think about industrial design, so it really opens the possibility of uh, mass customization when you are the mass production process, but every item is customized and is kind of made to measure, but in, a, in an industrial context. So at least that's the idea that, that's really the core of a lot of developments in 3D printing today and, and generative design. But the big question also remains, um, how do you fabricate? those items that are really unique. So that's really the core question. And I'm starting now to head towards uh, the, the research issue I investigated in the PhD. But to say, to give a, a bit of context about this, this question of fabrication, um, an object like this was, it was made by uh, Ross Lovegraf, uh, Ross Lovegraf, the a British designer, known for, for his organic design. It was the first mass consumption product uh, which was designed with parametric surfaces, or so nerve surfaces. So it's a complete uh, digital uh, design process, which is variable by definition, but then to mass produce this, a bottle of water needs to be cheap, so you use injection molding. Okay. So it's, uh, you, you make molds, and those molds are very expensive, can be hundreds uh, of thousands of, of, of euros to, to manufacture. So you can't have one mold per unique object. Even if you are able to generate unique objects, you can't make one mold every time because it would be pointless given the cost of the bottle. Okay, so um, at, at a certain time uh, in, in, in the history of development of digital design, there was a kind of um, a disjunction between the vision of mass uh, customization and the possibilities of the machine. But with 3D printing, suddenly it kind of opened uh, a lot of dreams because those technologies, they don't use molds. Okay, this is accelerated obviously. <laughs> It's not as fast, but still, it's uh, getting cheaper and cheaper and faster and faster. So we see more and more proposals of really bringing this to market. So using those technologies to really create mass customized products. 
So those are where, where the insoles of a pair, a pair of uh, sneakers that were actually sold by Adidas, and I think they, they made uh, quite a lot of those. Still quite expensive, and most problematically, non -pr uh, they were not custom. So the soles were the same, but you could totally imagine that the soles would be adapted to the runners uh, mm -hmm. or something like this. Okay, some, some studios have done projects. This is a startup that they do um, uh, earphones that are, they have a 3D printing part that is supposed to adapt to you, the, the shape of your ear, so you get some kind of ergonomics or at, at least a more tailored experience than when you, when you buy a, a standard set of earplugs. And then um, those were, are manufactured in the store itself. So in the retail, you've got those 3D printers and they really did. So it's kind of also bringing the factory to the store. It's, cre it's interesting also for this kind of um, uh, mixtures it creates between the different sites uh, of production and, and consumption. And also robotics, they open a lot of possibilities. So there's quite a lot of, of startups or um, ventures opening today w w for the architecture and uh, building industry. So this one, it's a Dutch startup and they use robotics and 3D printing to create uh, floors. And those floors are made of 3D printed plastic and you can basically <coughs> generate custom patterns and then they are filled with a terrazzo uh, made with recycled uh, marble or granite chips and you get, it's very, very, very cheap to make compared to, uh, you know, using a standard industrial production technique because basically the robot operation is kind of uh, low cost compared to a full uh, scale industrial production. So those, those are some of the excitement that, that uh, happens today with um, um, digital fabrication and especially 3D printing. But I want to say that it's not exactly new because in the 90s already uh, the theory of this notion of mass customization was already there and some designers were already playing with this and this was a, a company by Bernard Cash and Patrick Bosset, it's called Objectile, and they were selling uh, wood panels with acoustic or decorative properties and they were mass customized and you could buy them so you can still find on the internet some, some website about the construction industry showcasing the product. So they, they stopped the operation but, but, but still was very a pioneering experiment and it, uh, it, it comes back from the, the mid 90s. So 3D printing today makes it more uh, lively and, and, and closer to us but still um, the theory, at least, or the, the, the vision of mass customization is not something that's completely new. But there's one thing that's really less discussed, uh, we can say, in this vision of, of digital fabrication, is the question of materiality. So, which brings me now to the, my topic as a research, uh, or more specifically my, my PhD research. Um, I would define materiality in the general sense uh, not just simply as the material objects are made of, okay, but materiality it's really how we make the physical and sensory experience of the world around us, okay. So the materials contribute, but when it's, uh, it's uh, basically all, all built and, and natural environment contributes to the feeling of the material world around. So design has, has a role to play in materiality because the way you design objects constructs and builds a materiality, okay? Think, for instance, think of the electric, uh, the car, <laughs> or not specifically the electric car, but the car has transformed uh, the vision of materiality because before the car, you, for instance, you couldn't feel acceleration the way you feel now, okay? So this is an example of a design product that's transforming the experience um, of, the, of the material world. So, this question of materiality is still not completely uh, understood in relation with, with digital fabrication because in most cases we have this vision of, you know, ID, we design, we get a file, we fabricate, we get uh, an object, but it's still very linear. And um, especially if you think about 3D printers and those kind of machines, it makes you feel that those machines create perfect products, okay? It's like You've got a file, you print, you get the exact sort of same uh, object as if the material experience of the objects was already completely contained in the file. But I want to show you, going back to this example, that it's uh, very, it's completely a point of view because, so this, this is the bracelet I've shown you before. 
But if you look at the production process, the fabrication process, you see the different layers being uh, um, additively built on top of one another. So this is actually laser. It's a laser that solidifies a, a gold powder. And then a new layer of gold powder is put and the laser creates the next uh, contour until you get the object. But you see the object emerging from this, this, this powder and really the, the, the material quality of this object is extremely raw. It's very stone-like when it gets out of the machine. And to actually make it look like the digital file, like this, you need a lot of post-processing. You need 15 hours of manual, uh, of hand polishing to actually create this vision of the direct transition from file to object. Because the printer itself doesn't do it. Okay? The material quality of the object that's created by the printer is like this. It's really something that's completely different from any um, ID you could have a priori with the, with the software. Or you apply materials, you get something that looks like a metal, but when it gets out of the machine, it really adds its own qualities, and it's very something completely different. So it's not the digital fabrication itself that builds a, a connection between the computer and the material world, but it's also um, us as we, with our expectations that actually enforce this connection. And in this case, by actually polishing the bracelet until it's really shiny and looks like the like the 3D rendering. Okay, so we could. Maybe, that was one of the hypotheses in my PhD, maybe we could use those machines um, by giving a bit more space also in, in the design process about their own material qualities, about the own quality of the materials they are able to produce and engage. Okay? So that was the intuition at the, at the origin of, the, um, of my PhD research. And something also was... You know, when you do uh, a PhD, obviously you need to pay attention to the state of the art, or at least there needs to be some kind of context that kind of uh, where you frame the research, okay? And two things were especially interesting to me. So first was this notion of new materiality. Uh, so just the idea that digital tools were transforming the materiality, uh, as I explained before. And I, I really think, I thought it was an, an idea that was interesting to develop, but maybe trying also to drop some assumptions about how those tools should work, okay? Because maybe we can start to use those tools with their own material qualities instead of just trying to enforce perfect objects at the end. So maybe we can just try to, to, to challenge those assumptions. So this is a notion of a new materiality was, was interesting, to use digital tools to develop uh, this. And also in a more general context, in many uh, experiments and research, in design, but also in the material sciences, so in, in more uh, uh, scientific context, there is a kind of shift of the vision of matter. So traditionally, matter uh, is kind of seen as something that is passive, okay? And more and more, we, we hear scientists talk about active materials, so materials that have some behavior that are able to respond to certain conditions, where, well, actually the material is capable of action, okay? So it's no longer something that you shape, like a block of wood that you carve, but maybe something that's able to respond, change shape, change color, and this kind of thing. So maybe if you play, I don't know, with some, uh, there's some projects in electronics where you might use uh, textiles that are able to bend, or, you know, all these kind of things that we find in, in design. Also, it's very, it's, it's, um, there's also a connection to really, really um, cutting edge research in the material sciences about really materials that have, uh, that change shape, change transparency, uh, those properties. So this, is, this was interesting to connect. And in terms of design in fields like uh, architecture, architectural research, really in, in the last five years, there was a huge shift also of the way objects were uh, started to look. Because if you look, if you look at oh, the stuff that was done in the early 2000s, it was kind of smooth shapes, you know, very organic looking uh, objects, but now we see more and more messy uh, stuff that really highlights the messiness of matter somehow. On the, so this is a chair, actually, it's a, it's a Pelton chair that's printed, uh, cut uh, halfway and then assembled. And they really use the, so it's plastic, and they really use the, um, the potential of plastic to, to kind of self-organize and create those structures. 
has a really strong uh, aesthetic uh, property of, of, of the chair, okay? and also uh, more generally material, a structural property. So again, the, uh, maybe more in design, the work with clay of uh, Olivier van Ert as well, where he's playing with um, creating an atlas of shapes by modifying the parameters of the printer so it's the same file, but changing the properties of the printing, and it creates those variations in shape. But the material is really not making exactly the file you have on the computer, but it's really transforming in this, this shape and creating something uh, that is completely emergent. And um, I've, I'm part, since uh, not so long ago, but I've worked in the, in, in the PG with a group of researchers in. Uh, in Italy called Code It, and they really are focusing on this notion of material behavior and to build material experiments that uh, really highlight those behaviors. So it's not about making uh, um, commercial products yet, but it's more about exploring the possibilities of, of really changing the way we think about design. When it's not only geometry that we draw or we generate, actually, but, but when the material itself can uh, be a driver of geometry. So in this case, it's liquor um, and with plastic printed on it. And as the plastic kind of um, uh, solidifies, it retracts and you create those kind of curls. Because, so there's an interplay with the geometry, at, at which uh, the, the structure you use to depositing the material and the material's property that, that, that creates this. So it's very uh, interesting in light in this process, for instance, has been also used by the MIT um, uh, self-assembly lab to make uh, sneakers as well. So you could make the, the top part of uh, a pair of, of sneakers maybe with this. So you can 3D print flat and then it will go to shape just with the properties of the material. So you don't have to use a mold, you don't have to, to do expensive processes that, that really the, the shape itself is able to, to go from 2D to 3D. So very interesting as well for potential applications but again this is still at the level of research, it's still something very uh, emerging. But anyway, so I want to focus now um, on the, the work I did in this context to, to, for the last part of this uh, presentation. And um, I will um, say a few words also of the, the methodology of the research because it was a practical research and theoretical at the same time. That was kind of the challenge to really do practical experimentation but at the same time to try to frame it as I started to do it also in this presentation in a more global context so, so we can have a bit of perspective on this. Uh, so the, the research issue especially was to me to question how or thinking about design or practice of design uh, would be transformed by this notion of active materials, okay? How do we, and especially in, in the relation with digital design. Because um, digital design is really the tr is is really uh, <coughs> may, it's even more schematic than than some mm, it's very very schematic process most case because there's this idea that the digital machine will do exactly the same thing as you have on the screen okay and this but in a way this this notion that the, the fabrication is really something that is completely determined um, is really an old idea that you can trace back to the Renaissance with the invention of the modern notion of design, by, by, uh, uh, especially by Alberti, because if you think about architecture and the, the traditional process, um, the architect draw, draws plans of the building, but is not building uh, the, the building itself, okay, himself, he's really handing this to others and it's built according to plans, to specifications, because the design is really prescriptive, it frames, um, it frames what should be built and how. You always have margins of indeterminacy, but those kind of get lost when you start to talk about digital design because people really start to think that those machines can enforce uh, a strict equivalence between screen and, and matter. And this is especially true if you look at, at the emergence. And that's what, one thing I did in the PhD was to look at the history of digital design tools. So this is a screenshot of Katia, uh, 1988. And a fighter jet here. When they invented those tools, the, the, the huge revolution was that they could, for the first time, uh, represent really smooth and complex surface with curves, which was very, very hard to draw 
uh, manually. So even in the 60s, people would use mechanical tools called splines. And now we have splines on the computer, but those are mathematical uh, equations of, of curves and surfaces. Okay? So this was the huge revolution. And at the same time, they really invented, if you, if you trace the history of the development of those tools, they at the same time invented a kind of digital workflow where you could have the, um, the computer-aided design software and at the same time you could have a machine that would mill polystyrene or uh, any other material to make prototypes so you could control the curvature of your surface. So from the beginning this was integrated, okay, fabrication and manufacturing. And that the vision of a computer as a machine of doing is really linked to industries such as uh, aerospace or automobile. And what they wanted, basically, for also for political reasons, but, but also for really productivist reasons, was to have the most deterministic and, and previsible process possible. So as soon as you design the file, you want this to be the single reference you could use for manufacturing. You don't want someone uh, in the workshops coming to you and say, oh, I changed the shape of this, of this car, okay? Which was what happened before, okay? Even in the 60s, um, uh, for instance, if you take Citroën, the DS, it was modeled in, in clay and they do also models in wood and they had to preserve a one-to-one -one scale of the car, like an analog model and this would be, it was a lot of, uh, it was a huge problem also for preserving because it would get warped and so with the digital file it's like there's no possibility for discussion, you have the same thing. So it kind of embodies this vision of a direct okay, link between uh, the design and, and the object. And so that's why usually digital design is so uh, kind of strict and, 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 and linear in its way of, of envisioning materiality, okay? because it has really industrial um, background. So I wanted to try to think about less prescriptive or non-prescriptive relations between what you design and what you fabricate. How can you mix those two uh, steps that I I really define as fundamental steps in, in, uh, in, in the, the making of an object, or can you envision this as uh, being linked in a less prescriptive, less linear, less deterministic way, also to open uh, the possibilities of what we can make. So I don't want to um, spend too much time on the theory, so what I want, we'll do now maybe to, for the rest of this presentation, um, is saying a few words about uh, the methodology I followed on this, on this research and uh, also show you how I um, defended this research because it was, it was also a challenging part of it. And finally, I will show you the experiments I did. Okay, so let's go for the methodology. So this is the, the print uh, part of the thesis. I ended up writing quite a lot. It's a 500-page thesis, which is quite long. <laughs> Um, and uh, yeah, and you know, the funny part of it is that it's supposed to be practice based, so based on practice. So the idea was that you, you, your main body of research is your experiments and then you kind of document them and, and discuss them. But in the end, I thought there was so much this history of, of digital tools, we, there was such a need to do it that I ended up writing a lot also on the, on the theory. It's, it's not like great theory, it's not abstract theory. It's a theory that's really linked to practice and the, the materiality also of tools, of machines, and that's useful also to do as a designer. So really, for me, it was really important to do. But, but still, the, the biggest part was to make a lot of material experiments, and I call them experiments. Um, some were exhibited as, as artworks, but this, this notion of experiments is very important because it, it's really a question of method. An experiment is a kind of empirical data that you can use also to think after. If you think in the natural sciences, we'll do experiments also as a, in, a, in a complex relation with theory. Okay? Uh, the experiment triggers new theoretical development, also is able to verify hypotheses. So I wanted to have this kind of discussion, and I wanted to preserve this discussion also for the defense. And so for the defense, I had a jury discussion, but I also had an exhibition which was showing the five projects that I selected in the, um, in the book. Let's call it a book. And, um, because I did, I did much more than five projects, but eventually I selected five of those because I thought they would really stress the, 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 the most interesting points in the argument. 
And so the defense and the exhibition took place at the Gaete Lyrique in Paris. And the exhibition stayed open for a few days uh, more than just the, the defense. So here we have one of the projects. Um, you can see it doesn't look so digital, the projects for listeners. And, and that was one of the, my intentions was also to really do things that would be more about the material. So this, this was a project I, sh I will show later about uh, the, the thermal response of metals and aluminum in this case. Um, this is a glazed ceramics. And also we set up a mini uh, lab production system in the exhibition and we actually made objects with one of the, we recreated one of the production system in the exhibition. And also during the, when the jury visited we demonstrated this because demonstrating is also something that's very interesting for this kind of research where you also make your own tools, your own uh, instruments. So yeah, can I try to have this kind of loop at the same time, uh, always, which is, which is really challenging, but which is, to me was one of the main interests in doing this um, at the end. Okay, so I, I will skip the, the kind of theoretical developments because I, I talked a lot about it and let's talk about the experiments. So the first, so the first kind of experiments I, I did, I tried to frame them uh, until the, uh, under this category of open notations. So I can maybe just explain a bit. So a notation is uh, so, uh, it's, it can, it's a general term for a drawing or something that is supposed to, um, to say, oh, this should be built. Okay? So an architectural drawing, it's a notation. It's a notation of the building. Uh, if you think about um, an engineering drawing, it's also a notation with all the measurements, all the, the views in plans, uh, the sections. So, but what if those notations could, could, could be open? So instead of being completely, um, of framing all the aspects, all the material aspects of the, of the objects, what if they could manage or prepare some kind of openness so that it's not like you're defining everything that's going to happen when you fabricate, but more that you're preparing something that is indeterminate in the way that interests you. So the first way I, I, I tried to do this was trying to get to be very, very simple also in terms of, of shape. Um, and I wanted to work with the, the, the thermal uh, properties of metals and, and aluminum in this case. And I was interested in the possibility of creating some kind of, of of exploring, uh, let's say, the, 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 the shape generation capacity of the metal when you hit, when you hit it, okay? So in this case, I used a laser. So usually a laser, in, um, an industrial laser, it's, it's used to cut or to, to do letterings, for instance, if you want to do signage or this kind of stuff. In this case, I use it to really kind of etch the surface as if I wanted to do a monochrome, okay? Monochrome uh, painting or something, but you can see there was a texture that, that really emerged through this process, which is really somehow not something that is designed, and it really comes from the interplay between my notation, which I'm going to show just after, uh, so my kind of file also, if you the, the 2D file I, I, I sent to the machine, and um, the machine itself and the behavior of the material. So all those uh, agencies that, that really communicate uh, and negotiate with one another. So the, the file I used was this kind of really simple um, sets of lines, and I use this. So I call this a notation because you know it's something that you could draw. Or, uh, but I use this because it would trigger a kind of sweeping behavior of the laser. And I was also really interested in like programming this machine. But I, as I couldn't do it, I devised a way to make it do somehow what I wanted. Okay, so this is also the sense where you can use open uh, notations. Like well, you're doing something not because you expect to see the exact same thing, but because it, it tells the machine to do what you want for a result that you can't predict. It's so, sort of um, the philosophy behind it. Uh, there was this project as well, we pushed this notion a bit forward. Uh, it was a project on, I wanted to use, uh, to work on the, the, the process of molding, so making molds and, and with concrete. But I was interested in the way, usually, you know, molding is kind of, um, you, have, you have the form, the mold is the negative, and you get, you get the positive. All of it is kind of a, 
it can be very, it's not, we know it's not like that, but we, it can be very schematic. So I wanted to kind of really show, uh, create a modeling process which would be completely uh, um, uh, kind of opposite to this vision, positive, negative of form. Okay, so the way I did that was to try to build molds as materials, so with an inner structure, so that when you I, I put concrete on top of it and then when I would just separate it for the concrete, I could get some kind of accidents that were sort of prepared so it, it, and so I could get objects which would have a, a concrete base with a surface with um, interesting uh, properties uh, in terms of aesthetics which would come from the fact that part of the mold would remain trapped basically in the concrete remain trapped in the concrete okay so the process is like, like that to be very um, uh, precise about it so you have the, the mold which is 3D printed and which has this structure that's designed to create those failures, uh, those areas, and then you, you create some kind of, um, what's it called in English? Coffrage. Uh, uh, formwork, okay, formwork, and then you pour concrete on top of it, and finally you are able to separate this object. And I recently discovered that actually some architecture studios are also investigating uh, this kind of process, not, not the same, but this idea of molding, uh, doing formwork that creates those kind of surface effects. Also because if you think about the, this kind of thing, it can be interesting if you want to have uh, vegetals or, or living systems growing on top of the concrete because it really provides um, potential points you know, for, for this kind of thing. So in my case it was more an experiment or uh, driven by aesthetic reasons but it can also be connected with, uh, with possible developments after. But it's more working on the process right now. And the structure, the inner structure, is a play on the structure that's usually generated by 3D printers. So when you work with a 3D printer, it creates this kind of um, <coughs> honeycomb structure inside the part. Usually it's uniform, because it's meant to, it's really strong structure, honeycombs. And you don't want the, the, the part to be fragile at certain, uh, you want this to be as, as sturdy as you want, as if it was a full part, okay? In my case, I try to divide these in cells, like in, in triangles, and I use uh, computation to, to generate uh, a variation of the structure inside each cell. And then the tricky part was to, to tell the machine to print it like that, because the machine doesn't allow you usually to design the interior of the part. The machine, you give it the, the, the shell, if you want, of the part, the, the, the envelope, and it generates the structure for you. In this case, I had to kind of find the kind of a hack to, to, put, to force the machine to follow all those um, trajectories that would create the internal structure. Um, I could have programmed the machine, but I, it would, would be... So it's, again, an, an open notation in a sense that it's a file, it's something that's very precisely defined, but then the result is kind of uh, emergent in respect to this. So, those two examples of open notations and, and again trying to give also names or to group experiments by proposing concepts so the, uh, I think is an interesting uh, or my, at least that's the way I did it try to, to create a sense of, of continuity sometimes between experiments that were made um, actually f between the, the first one in metal and this one I think there was a two years gap but still after I could, I could feel that they fit in the same kind of mindset um, but I wanted also to try to be, um, and maybe it's the last one I will show, um, so just a short selection. I wanted to try to kind of escape this, 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 this linear vision that you still have in the previous processes, because even if it's an open notation, even if you get something that is emergent, I'm still designing and then I'm fabricating. It's not, there's not really a real feedback from the, from the material uh, to, to the, the computer, which, which all the design information. So what if we could just uh, envision fabrication as something that has a more temporal uh, spread, okay, that you can also uh, create some kind of feedback loops inside of it. So to work on this uh, ID, I contacted uh, the researchers at CODE, researchers and designers, and I proposed them, so they, they had a huge experiment, experiment, experience in working with uh, robotics. So this is in Turin at the uh, Fab Lab uh, Torino, and this is so they have a, a, a robot arm. So the type of which you see in in production lines 
to make cars, basically. And um, this is an extruder, so basically it's doing 3D printing in clay, and I propose that we could um, create a, an experimental system that would make objects, basically, without any uh, drawing part, so which would be kind of self-generating, okay? So, kind of very experimental and, 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 and tricky thing to do. So the way I approached this was to have a kind of different steps. So a first step that would kind of deposit material in a way that would leave it um, the possibility to kind of self-organize, create structures or potential structures, and then use a scanning technology kind of uh, simple with a Kinect, you can see on top left, and trying to get a digital representation of what you get printed, and then use some basic machine learning to generate new uh, trajectories to print on top of this, this data. So the idea was not to be able to really understand the behavior of the material, or to describe, or to model, even. I, I was not interested or not pretending to model the behavior of the material, but really more to, to have the digital uh, operate at a kind of really closeness of feedback with the material, so as to have something interesting in terms of, of, of effects. So really, um, it's, it's a different mindset of trying to model the behavior of the clay, which actually is very, it's very complex. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, this, is, this is called a, a, an instability, and it's actually, um, some, some people in physics are working on these kind of structures, would be, way beyond my, my skills in terms of modeling. So, but in this case, it's more interesting to, to really engage in an open process about this and try to see uh, what it can bring. So you get those kind of weird shapes where you have different layers and, and the layers, they show some kind of, um, it's still very uh, messy and, and, and you know, um, totally non-functional, those are, uh, experimental samples, but then you get kind of a progression of, of material qualities. You can see there's a densification, and those are effects that really, personally, I think very interesting, like this kind of, kind of uh, I don't know what to call them, but almost like a liquid effect on clay, which would be super hard to model as well, and which have a very expressive character. And of course, because it's clay, then you can connect to craft as well and bake it, and then they'll become... Um, you know, they become art objects if you, if you choose to, to, to show them also in this context. So this was done with a, a ceramist, uh, Bruno De Masi, uh, who was also in Turin. And I'm going to finish maybe quickly by showing you uh, a video of the process, uh, which, so you see the software here, and you see the scan. Uh, that, so that's not the scan yet, it's the, the initial phase. So it's generating those initial, uh, trajectories of the robot and then you generate uh, directly the code so it's, it speaks directly to the robot there's no and you can see the, fir the first part is really uh, so we maintain the distance so we're not printing in contact because we are interested in creating those instabilities and those, those structures okay kind of putting ourselves in a, in a tricky situation by design so we can get something, uh, something interesting. So this is five times speed. And then you can see the data now that's been scanned in the application. Uh, so this was done in processing actually. Uh, and yeah, I mean the resolution is not too bad. It's really a kind of DIY, <laughs> 3D scanning, but it's, it's okay. And then very basic machine learning that tries to propose, so there's a lot of heuristics and I really tried, um, so it was not a scientific process, but I tried to have at least some parameters that I could assess the effect at the end. So I tried also in the PhD to discuss the effect of those parameters and the kind of shape it creates. And so this one was funny, it created a kind of funnel structure, almost like a, like a yeah, like, a, like an object, like a vase. And so those are step three and step four that you can see at the same time. And obviously there's no limit to where you can go. You could just create something. Probably after a while it would break everything. <laughs> it's actually in the right, it starts to collapse, which is part of the fun also. You know, it's very, it's very, just very fun to do. Um, but it's, you know, you end up when you're, usually when you run out of clay or when you have something you want to keep and it's not like you're trying to make something 
completely well de defined before. So yeah. So this one is another. You see, this one has a different ma uh, material organization. It has seven zones. It's not like a single. So it's really sometimes you get. Um, yeah, you get you get interesting um, structures out of it. So I'm going to skip this one and just show you one thing, and then we my last slide. So this might be two last slides. So to conclude, uh, I'm, as you know, I'm teaching here. I'm also, I did a workshop this uh, in January at uh, NSAD, so where I did the, the PhD, uh, and we also worked with clay printing, and I, I, it, w it was interesting because it was just after the, the defense. But somehow, um, those were the results that the students were doing, so they were also interested in, in exploring with the single file, you could get very, very different results if you modify the parameters of the machine. So they actually made, they 3D printed the nozzle, so the, the shape that extrudes the clay. And you can see this one which looks like, like Chantilly or whatever. It's a uh, star-shaped. And this is the same file, but with a regular uh, round uh, shape. So, but I, I really think it's interesting because obviously I could help a bit also with my experience on clay and I, I think it's interesting also this notion of practice-based PhDs because um, it's also connected to, to education and transmission. So um, being able to, to engage into a reflection on your work also, I could, you know, I proposed them at some point the idea that maybe they file is a single notation but they, they can make it open by modifying some other parameters. And I think that kind of helped them to frame this, this project uh, in this way. So that's definitely the kind of thing uh, I'm interested in for the next years, I hope. Thank you. which is, what is the most meaningful learning experience that you had, ever? <laughs> so ever? It's, not, it's not just the PhD, it's, it's in general. Okay. Because as we are an educational institution, and we have students, and it's something that is maybe important to share yeah. with them. I think it's definitely uh, working in different contexts. Uh, also, because I have, I have a, a background in engineering, uh, first, and then I, I, I developed a practice in design. So, and then I went to the, the school uh, in Saab, so it's an it's a, uh, art school. And, and then for, for some of this uh, work, like the, the one in robotics, I worked at the Fab Lab in Chumin. And it was very, very uh, good also in the context of the PhD to be able to shift, to, to come several times and to, to find a different environment, different uh, relation to time. The, use of, the organization of space, the use of materials, and I think every time ch being able to, to change this context, you know, also in terms of architecture, also in terms of the space you work in, uh, was really, really a uh, helpful way. So, And I, I like the fact that it was, for instance, at the Fab Lab, it, it was kind of sometimes not well you know, defined or informal, or so the time of day you work in. Uh, to me, I found this was very, uh, I learned a lot by changing, you know, those material, <laughs> material conditions of the work itself. So, yeah. What did you call the, for the clay, the string that went off? It was the aberration? Yeah, uh, instabilities. Instability. Yeah, insta love that word. yeah. yeah. <laughs> and actually, I, I showed this to a, a, a physicist at the um, uh, uh, ESPCI, so uh, Ecole de Supérieure de Physique Chimie Industrielle de la Ville de Paris. Long name, uh, which is in the not not far from our school, and um, he said when I showed him, him this, he said, "Oh, it's really funny. It's like you really have the kind of structures that that my colleague is studying, like this. And you really try to model this kind of thing, but I don't know the name of the colleague. I forgot. But the physicist was Benoit Roman. You, I think you, you know him, and um, but obviously in this case, it's uh, yeah, you know, it's it's. Are they mathematical educations, or, or how do they arrive, or is it just a physical property? I think it's very hard to model it mathematically. Hmm. Apparently, apparently. Uh, so, but in this case, it's a, it's an example of a process that that tries to, to 
to, to connect the digital with the physical without trying to model. Without trying to model. And, but instead, as I said, trying to operate at, at some kind of closeness. Without trying to model the physical, but just by using uh, scanning, but more as a, as, as a heuristics. Okay, scanning as a way to... Uh, but obviously it has its limitation, and I think it can be interesting as well to, to be maybe more precise also on the, on the scanner, at least to try to incorporate some elements of modeling. But maybe you can't model everything, and I think one of the potential applications for this would be, for instance, in construction, and some, some people are working on those kind of feedback strategies, where you have construction processes that are extremely hard to predict. For instance, if you think about um, polyurethane foam, uh, polyurethane, yeah, that's used for insulation mostly, and but this is a really nice material that really you know takes a lot of uh, that has nice uh, isolated qualities, but also builds volume very fast and super hard to model. Okay, the expansion. So if you can just let the expansion happen in the physical world, but then being able to kind of incorporate this as a feedback, and then maybe you can start to design with it. You know, so. Uh, when you're doing the iterations, you just have stage one, two. Yeah. Are you setting what the next iteration? No, will, will uh, no, no. This is completely generated by the by the strategies I set, and I try not to modify this while it was running. Uh, I would sometimes regenerate, you know, because. <laughs> but as I said, not completely scientific. But I I try because I wanted to discuss this also in the context of the PhD. So also maybe make it useful to to other people, uh, you need to be able to get some kind of consistency for between runs. So I would, for instance, those parameters, they would control, they would control several uh, kind of the settings of, the, of the, the strategy, basically, that would try to build height. height. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know since today that don't say hate, but height, but yeah, trying to build height. And you learn every day. That's that's my biggest learning experience. <laughs> <laughs> second, learning. yeah, second, <laughs> second biggest. So yeah, try the, the, the kind of um, a test case was trying to build uh, heights, and I there were several strategies that I did designed, but I every time I was doing a run, I was testing some sets of parameters, not trying to change. So it could be, for instance, um, there was some kind of a, if I. I can be a bit more specific, there was some kind of reward strategy that would progressively reward some zones. You could see I have some zones here. I have one, two, three, four, five zones. And would be more and more selective. And the way, the kind of function I use to set this reward was parametric and this was something I could control. And I tried to keep the same um, for every run here. And did you, you must have had really drastic differences. Have you, have you tried real-time feedback? That it was the first uh, uh, intention I had, but it was not possible uh, with this, with the, the technology we use for controlling the robot. But it's something they are developing now uh -huh. in Turin, and yeah, it's it's super interesting. But it, uh, the, uh, on the other hand, it was also interesting to have non-real time because then you get this notion of steps, yeah. and it transforms the way you think about it because you know you you are able to deposit more material so. You get some effects with the steps that are interesting as well. Like, say, for instance, if you look at this shape, it's kind of structures. So this basically happens uh, because I generate the trajectories, but then I'm not updating those trajectories as I, as I print. So if the material is able to build, then at some point it starts to touch the extrusion. And then you get some kind of live shaping of the material in this kind of circular patterns, which was something that was completely unpredictable. But that's actually very interesting because one of the good part of working with clay is that it takes a lot of time to dry. So it's still something that remains plastic when you, when you fabricate, contrary to doing the same experiment in plastic, for instance. So Did you really try different, different materials? Or uh, they try, they, they work with plastic, but me, I work only with clay. With this. But we, we did work with different types of clay and with different mixtures of clay as well. So clay, depending on the, first the atmosphere and also the way it's prepared, uh, you get really different properties. It can be very liquid or it can be very kind of dry. And this really changes the, the kind of behavior you get. Especially with these kind of instabilities, those where um, this really has to do with the, the relation of two parameters, this, 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 the flow of the clay 
and the speed of motion of the robot. So it's really only a certain combination that gives those kind of structures. If you go too fast, you get a straight line. But it's extremely complex. There's a lot of. Uh, Why did you yeah. choose the clay? How was the how okay. worked the choice? Actually? The choice. It was. It was also. Um, I, I was interested in clay for different on different levels. There was a kind of pragmatic level because they had some experience with this and they were interested in pushing this for uh, uh, an experiment as invited research. Because plastic, it's you know, it's kind of. Um, there's also less potential application because with clay, it's a very interesting material, uh, also for construction. You know, you can bake it; it's not very strong. And one one additional thing was that there's still this connection to craft, which is which I think is interesting. I try not to. Usually, I'm I'm not a huge fan of this notion of digital craft, which I actually kind of deconstructed a bit in the PhD. But but without using this term, it's still interesting to see how you can. Um, you know, uh, use traditional techniques in relation to this process. Yeah, so that I was also interested in, in clay for this reason, for the material quality, mm -hmm. which you don't really have with plastic, because you know when you 3D print with plastic, also the material um, stay, it, it really um, cools very fast, and then after it's not really moving. The clay it can collapse; you can get really different uh, effects. We have a drink upstairs. We can continue the discussion. Cool. You can mm -hmm. ask questions more privately and not mm -hmm. in front of the camera, which is oh, all right, <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay. So thank you very much. Thank you. It was great to have you. It was really very interesting. I had a lot of questions, so I will ask you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thanks. <laughs>